Well, if the Jewish people were known for anything, it was for being really, really, really religious. The only religious group in the Roman Empire allowed to conduct its own worship without any attention at all to the cult of the emperor, the, the cult that declared Caesar God on earth. The religious group so interested in its scripture and its interpretation that rabbis had almost celebrity status. The group so dedicated to God that they constructed what was at that time the largest structure on earth dedicated to worship, the temple. And for them, going to the temple was probably a little like us going to Disney World. Amid the splendor of the temple, you could take ritual baths for purification. You could take in worship services. You could walk around and hear rabbis expounding on the scriptures. And you could just marvel at the idea that you were near the presence of God, that God was literally in the Holy of Holies, sitting on that throne that Moses had made him, the Ark of the Covenant. And, of course, you could sacrifice. Now, in the time of Christ, sacrifice typically only happened at the temple. And following the ancient traditions, the blood of an animal was offered up to atone for human sin. And so, with this method of getting right with God and all these other things, I've mentioned, the temple offered the Jewish person the chance to be with God. But the funny thing about a blood offering, it has to be perfect. No bumps, no bruises, no scrapes, no cuts, nothing that could end up making it sick or making it, in a sense, a more convenient sacrifice, or we might call it a less expensive sacrifice. So if you were traveling to the temple from, say, Nazareth, with an animal that you were going to sacrifice, you would spend an awful lot of time freaking out about keeping this animal in one piece, about keeping it alive in the suburb in the birdcage, about keeping it hydrated, and so on. Traveling to the temple with a sacrifice was difficult because if that animal's damaged it all in transit, the priest would deem it Unworthy. So, the customer service industry was born. <laughs> the temple hired folks to raise animals for sacrifice that the folks coming to worship could purchase right then and there, and then they would be used in the service. So, this saved the people all that trouble of trying to cart animals up and down those dusty roads. All sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Set that usually worked something like this. Uh, Joe asked you to come over for a minute. I've got a pilgrim here. It's going to show you. Hi, Joey. We've never met you before, right? That's good. All right. Joey, Joey just had a son, lucky guy. And he has to buy two doves in the de for the dedication service for his son. And he has some coins for me. He has five coins. And with these five coins, we're going to buy a dove for you, okay? Okay. Oh, but wait a minute. These coins have the head of Caesar on them. You see that? I know it looks like George Washington, but it's Caesar. Okay. Okay. So, lucky for you, we've got a money changer here. We'll give him the five coins, and you get back four temple coins. Okay? You see, Caesar claims to be God on earth, so we can't use his coins in the temple. Okay? So, God's coins, of course, are going to be worth more. That's why you only get four or five coins. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> All right. You give me those. I will purchase those doves, and they'll be at your son's service, okay? All right, good. Thank you. A little appreciation for Joey, please. <laughs> My grandparents were really surprised. Anyway. <laughs> there was a problem. That offering that Joey just made, it kind of went like this. Rome's money was no good in the temple, but Rome got its share of God's money. And then, of course, the priests got their share of God's money, too. Now, some of this is understandable because, hey, you know, they had to make a living. 
But these priests, they didn't do a whole lot to become priests. They were just born into the right family. And they weren't the spiritual leaders of the people. They were separate from the people. They were high class. They were in bed with Rome. Rome even picked their leadership. So the people weren't all that crazy about them. So that left a little money left over. And yeah, some of it was probably used to help the poor. But you know, Disney World, it doesn't stay all clean and magical for nothing. And neither did the temple. And we've just found out in the Gospel of John, it wasn't even finished yet. They were still constructing it. So that's where a lot of the money went to, just to keep things going. So customer service wasn't all that much about the customer. And it's all this that sends the Prince of Peace into a whip-wielding, table-turning tizzy that what tradition has become called the classic. Now, even with all this information, it's hard to tell exactly why Jesus did this, but those other three Gospels we have, the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all put the cleansing of the temple at the end of Jesus' ministry. It's fodder for his crucifixion. Now, John puts it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, just before he's about to go out. And I don't think it's because John's a bad historian. I think John's making a point. That with Jesus, the old ways were gone, and the new way of the kingdom was just beginning. Remember Isaac, that kid from the old, 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 old days who almost went the way of some kids from that time? He was almost sacrificed. Well, in that event, Abraham and Isaac both, both learned God didn't want that anymore. And so God gave him a ram to sacrifice. But sacrifice has always been a blood game. In the oldest days, children being sacrificed to appease God. Centuries of animal sacrifice to appease God. Even circumcision has a sacrificial element to it with the blood spilled there. And all this went on and on, even as the prophets in the word it, using the voice of God said, I hate your sacrifices. I despise your festivals. Jesus came and was God incarnate. God breathing the air we breathe, eating the food we eat. God with blood running through his veins, just like our blood. God letting the spirit out all among the followers. And that kind of idea was very dangerous to a religious system that said, if you want to get close to God, go visit his house. You go get near him and you buy an animal to sacrifice. Jesus was God loose in the world. Dick gave you that great image last week, the baptism of Jesus in, in Mark, where the heavens are seen as being torn open and the Spirit comes rushing down into the world. That kind of idea, that's the kind of idea that can bring a temple down. And that's really what Jesus is doing symbolically here. He's tearing down the temple. He's calling for reform. He is shutting the place down momentarily, I'm sure, by stopping its commerce. And this did not win any friends among the high -ups. But here's the message. You have been given, we have been given, a God who came to be among us, who is among us, who's revealed to us, who chooses to reside with us in the spirit. We don't need a priest to make intercession for us. We don't need some rite of purification to make sure God will pay attention to us. We don't need the blood of some poor creature to appease an angry God. God's Son has walked and continues to walk with us. God's Son has purified us and sacrificed for us, and now gives us the chance to grow with God through the Word, the sacraments, and through the revealing of the Spirit in our interactions with one another here in the community. Jesus did more than turn over a few tables on this day. Jesus started to turn the world upside down. And now, Jesus gives us the mission to do the same. 
<clears throat> there are a lot of tables that need turned out there. The poor in this country are largely ignored. That's a table that needs turned. I heard this week that in this school district that we're in right now, 35% of the kids are living below the poverty level. That's a table that needs turned. There are too many Christians who only expound justice and don't live out God's love. That's a table that needs turned. Too many who hang on to their earthly treasures and who don't share them the way God wants them shared. That's a table that needs turned. Too many who act like the only kingdom of God is when you go to heaven. And that the kingdom can't be here too. That, perhaps more than anything, is a table that must be turned. And if you listen to this list and start to say, wow, that's heavy. Good luck there, Mike. Not sure how I'm going to help you. I'm with you. I don't have all the answers either. But remember, with every step in this life, the God who took human flesh, who had the same blood we have, who gave everything so that we could be one with God, fights with us. Do the little things. Proclaim this God in the situations and opportunities that arise in your life and through God's grace, change can happen. The tables will be turned. And they will turn for good.